Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. This is Andrei Shetnikov with you, and our video today will be dedicated to Coulomb's law, the first established quantitative law in the theory of electricity. In the 18th century, it was already known that there are two types of electric charges, like charges repel each other, and unlike charges attract each other. Therefore, various scientists were interested in the question of how exactly the interaction between charged bodies occurs and what the force of this interaction depends on. And so they conducted corresponding experiments. And in 1785, the French engineer and scientist Charles Coulomb published his work, in which he presented the results of experiments measuring the force of interaction between electric charges. The basis of Coulomb's apparatus was his invention of the torsion balance. This is a thin thread with a beam, with a small ball attached to one end and a counterweight on the other, which serves to dampen the oscillations of the beam. The second ball is fixed in place. At the beginning of the experiment, the balls touch each other. An electric charge is transferred to them using a pin, and the movable ball on the beam is repelled from the stationary one. Then the experimenter rotates the top knob, bringing the balls closer together, and uses two scales to measure the angle of the thread's twist, which is proportional to the repulsive force between the balls and the distance between the balls. And as a result of his experiments, Coulomb established that the repulsive force between two small charged balls is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the centers of these balls, which in general was not unexpected for him, because it was already known that according to Newton's law of universal gravitation, gravitating masses also attract each other with a force inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. However, Coulomb was dealing not with attraction, but with the repulsion of electric charges. And now we, Undi, will reproduce Coulomb's result on our rather rudimentary setup. Here, one ball is hanging like this on a balance and a needle, while I can move the other ball on a stand. Ah, uh, if both balls are charged from a high voltage source, then when I bring one closer, the other ball will repel from it. I slowly move one ball towards the other and the balance gradually begins to deflect. So I know both the distance between the balls and uh, the angle of deflection of the balance, which is proportional to the repulsive force. Here are the experimental points obtained as a result of tracing. And it is evident that they fit perfectly on the curve of inverse squares adjusted to them. I would like to experiment with the attraction of the balls on this same setup, but there are some issues. I negatively charge this ball. I rearrange the wire. Now I positively charge this ball. I place the negatively charged ball back, start moving it closer, and oops, I barely moved it closer when the balls Attracted, a short circuit occurred, and the experiment ended. However, Coulomb devised a clever experiment for this case as well. Here, on the right, a beam with a small ball at the end is suspended on a very thin nylon thread. And on the left, there is a large ball. And now the small ball and the large ball are charged with opposite charges. So they attract each other. And if you nudge the beam in the horizontal plane, the small ball starts to swing, like a peculiar pendulum, precisely because of the attraction to the large ball. Here are our experimental results. According to the theory, if the interaction force between charges decreases as 1 over r squared, the oscillation period should increase proportionally to the distance. And our experimental points indeed lay close to a straight line, passing through the origin. We have figured out the dependence of force on the, the distance between charges. 
Now we need to understand the dependence of the force on the magnitude of the charges. And here it seems quite natural to assume that if one charge is doubled, the force will also double. And if the second charge is also doubled, the force will increase by another factor of two, that is, by a total of four. In general, in this sense, the force should be proportional to the product of the charges. And now we will also try to verify this experimentally. The idea of the experiment is as follows. I will now charge not both spheres from 30 kilovolts, but only one. And I will touch the second sphere to the first one. Now the charge received by the first sphere is distributed between both spheres. Both spheres now have half or the charge. Well, I will again bring the first sphere closer and observe how it deviates from the vertical under the weight of the second sphere. And here are the experimental points and their approximation by power functions. The power is quite in order here. Both times it is equal to minus 2. The inverse square law is fulfilled with good accuracy. But the coefficients for this power differ not by four times as I expected, but almost by five times. In this regard, the experiment turned out to be quite rough. And it seems I even understand what the issue is. The spheres I have are made quite roughly, and they are not identical, only approximately so. And this means that the charge between them was not distributed exactly equally. One has slightly more than half, and the other slightly less than half. And then the product of such factors is less than one uh, quarter, which is what we uh, observed in this experiment. And here I must make a few remarks. The first is that Coulomb's law, the inverse square law, 1 over r squared, is formulated for point charges that have no size. But if I conduct experiments with metal spheres, charging them both negatively with the same charge, then when I move one sphere towards the other, the electrons being negatively charged will repel each other, redistribute on the surfaces of the spheres, move to their rear sides, and the spheres will no longer interact according to Coulomb's law. For their interaction to be close to the inverse square law, the spheres must be sufficiently far apart compared to their radii. Furthermore, I want to note that the inverse square law is valid not only for the interaction of stationary point electric charges. The force of universal gravitation also decreases according to the inverse square law. And the intensity of light radiating in all directions from a point source also decreases inversely proportional to the square of the distance. In the case of light, everything is clear. The light flux through spheres of different radii will be the same. The area of the sphere increases proportionally to the square of the radius, and thus the light flux per unit area decreases inversely proportional to the square of the radius. And for a point electric charge, according to the inverse square law, the intensity of the electric field decreases, which we will discuss in one of the following videos. And the third comment, Coulomb, in his experiments with charged spheres, established the inverse square law only approximately. But in theory, we assume that this law is absolutely precise, and we develop the theory on this basis. Then physicists test the foundations of the theory and its conclusions in increasingly precise experiments. And today it is established that Coulomb's law holds with the highest precision across various scales, down to the size of elementary particles. And what is particularly interesting is that the first such test was conducted 10 years before Coulomb carried out his experiments. And this was done by the remarkable English physicist Henry Cavendish. You can read about his experiments in Filonovich's book The Fate of the Classical Law. The entire book is dedicated to the history of Coulomb's law. And the idea of Cavendish's experiment can be demonstrated as follows. If I were to charge this sphere right now and touch it with a small uncharged sphere, 
part of the charge would transfer to the small sphere. And this is understandable. But there is a hole made at the top of this sphere. And we will again imagine that we charge it. And then I touch the inside of the sphere with this small sphere and take it back out. And it turns out that if the inverse square law holds true, then the charge on this small sphere after such an action will be exactly zero. And Cavendish tested this very fact and established that the power of 2 in the denominator is accurate to within plus or minus one fiftieth of a unit. And now, using Coulomb's law, we can introduce the unit of charge. In the Gaussian CGS system, this is done very simply. Coulomb's law is directly written in this form, and it is declared that a unit charge is such that two unit charges, being at a unit distance, interact with a unit force. Well, in the CGS system, the distance is taken as a centimeter and the force as a dyne. And accordingly, charges, or are those which, being at a distance of one centimeter, interact with a force of one dyne. In the SI system, a unit charge of one coulomb is defined through the unit of current, one ampere. And a coulomb is such a charge that flows through the cross-section of a conductor in one second, when a current of one ampere flows through this conductor. Accordingly, we have our own unit of charge here. And therefore, Coulomb's law takes this form with the coefficient k. Since charges here are measured in coulombs, distance in meters, and force in newtons, the coefficient k is numerically approximately equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons per square meter divided by square coulombs. But in an advanced textbook, it will be written that k is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is the electric constant. And it is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th farads per meter. But this clearly goes beyond the scope of our video today. And that's not even all. Because recently, the Coulomb has been defined differently. You need to take such a number of electrons to get an elementary charge. Well, actually, negative one Coulomb. But there's no need to fear such numbers. To solve school-level problems in electrostatics, it's enough to remember the numerical value of the coefficient k, sacre. And with that, our discussion on Coulomb's law concludes. And in the following videos, we will talk about the electric field and Gauss's theorem, about potentials and capacitance. And you can write your questions under this video. And now, 